Great. So it's, um, it's our great pleasure tonight to have Philip Mercier to present his talk, Why is Prince Edward Point So Important for Migration? Um, so again, I want to remind people to use the, the chat function and a few other things. And now I'm going to hand it over to Susan Warwick, who will introduce Philip. Take it away, Susan. <laughs> we'll take it away. OK, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, well, I have the pleasure of introducing Philip tonight, better known as the bander in charge at Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. Nice to see you, Phil. Um, he is an environmental biologist and he studied with wildlife biology at McGill University, I think specifically the um, McDonald campus, right, in St. Anne de Bellevue. Yeah. And um, well, he's a bird bander and an ornithologist and uh, he was previously a bander in charge at Owl Moon Environmental. Fort McMurray, way out there, and uh, yeah, and uh, also a bander at Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory at Washington College. So right now he's heading into his third year at Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory, and he certainly left his mark there. Aside from his knowledge, his enthusiasm, and his great sense of humor, he spearheaded some important changes from my perspective anyway. And one of them is actually the MAPS program, which is something new for the Bird Observatory. I think we're going into our third year of that. It's a five-year program. And uh, Philip started that the first summer that he was here. And um, it's MAPS, so M-A-P-S, and it stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. So basically, what they do is once the spring banding is done, they head out to four different places in the county. And uh, I guess Sandbanks Provincial Park, um, the Miller Reserve, there's a few different places. Maple and, Grass Coastline Reserve as well, and then right. a location in the wildlife area, uh, right. just further right. away from the station. Right, so basically what that is, is they're really monitoring nesting birds and their hatchlings to see how they survive and what happens to them during the whole process of hatching babies. So this is something new and it's kind of an exciting program from my perspective anyway, because we've never done it before. And um, another thing that he started too, that is new for since he's been there is a, a volunteer training program where volunteers like myself can actually learn how to extract birds from the net. Now, we never usually had a chance to do that before. It was always too busy. There never was enough people to help train us, but Phil has really made it possible for people like me and anyone to learn this. So it's been a really rewarding experience for all of us who are starting to do this now. And at least we feel like we can contribute a little more to you know, the whole volunteer experience and help things run a little smoother. Although some of us need extra help, right, Philip? <laughs> anyway, so, um, and from my perspective, I guess, as a volunteer, since Philip took over, I've noticed that we now have a lot of younger volunteers. And there's a really great camaraderie, not only between the staff, but between the staff and the volunteers. And even on those really insanely busy days, like there's such a sense of having fun and you know, supporting each other and respect. And it's a really nice teamwork that's going on now there at the Bird Observatory. So it's really, it's really great. And it really is thanks to you, Phil, because you've really made a difference there. And lastly, before I move on to Phil, I just want to say three little interesting facts about Philip that you probably don't know. Uh, number one, he has an amazing singing voice. <laughs> I couldn't resist saying this. Um, one day I was following him down the trail and he just burst into song. And I was like, oh my God, this is just amazing. And I just couldn't understand like how someone with this amazing voice and talent ends up as a bird bander. So then maybe a few times later that I was volunteering, I met his parents, specifically his mom. Now his mom, of course, is an avid birder and bander and she spends a lot of time at the bird observatory just helping to band and helping out. So once I met his mom, I realized, okay, he has grown up with this stuff. So that might be why. And the third thing I wanna to mention too, is that as a scribe, and you know, you have to write down or type all the information 
when you have to scribe for Phil, he is the fastest bander I have ever seen. So if he suddenly just starts banding, you're sort of sitting there if you're the scribe going, oh my God, you know, you have to really be on your toes because he just whips through it so quickly. Anyway, so I think hopefully I haven't totally embarrassed you and <laughs> I'll pass it over to you, Phil. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the spring. Yeah, me too. Well, that was a really nice introduction. Thank you for outing all my secrets. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, just giving you guys a little bit more information about Pepo and kind of why I fell in love with the place and why we're so important in my opinion. So I will share my screen and then I guess we can get started. All right, and present. I think this works. Okay, well, so as you can see, this is the observatory. Um, uh, you've heard my name is Philip. I'm the station manager at Pepo. So I've been here for, for three years, um, or I guess this is my third year now, as Susan mentioned. And so uh, I took over in 2021. Um, so who we are, Pepo is a registered charity and nonprofit organization where we run a variety of different things or we have a multitude of things kind of on our mandate. Uh, we run the banding station, which is the major part of the organization because it's a high volume station that gets a lot of data every year. And so um, we run spring and fall migration. And as Susan mentioned, we also run our map station. Um, the spring and fall migration seasons can to combine will usually provide us with about 10 to 15,000 birds. And then our map season is usually anywhere from five to 1,000 birds, 500 to 1,000 birds. Um, so that kind of keeps us busy for about seven months out of the year. And then the rest of that time is spent uh, doing our uh, yearly report, which um, we just actually finished now that should be submitted and available for everybody to see in the coming couple of weeks, I presume. Um, and so we have a lot of stuff that we do in the off season, which is why Pepo has now been able to hire somebody, finally been able to hire somebody year round um, to do this stuff. We do a lot of public presentation. So as you saw in the first image, the station is very open and very welcoming to the public. So a lot of people come down to the station to learn about birds or to see kind of what we're doing. We've updated our station to include a, a presentation style with a TV now so people can watch the banding from outside. And then we also talk to them about any kind of information they might want to know about the station. Uh, Kind of on a similar note is education. We do um, try to bring in people to teach them about what we do um, specifically. So we were running the Naturehood program um, where school students came out to the point to learn about nature or about birds or about bird banding. We've had high school students come down to um, learn hands-on experience for the their future careers. And we kind of try to put in some kind of education into it more than just showing somebody a bird with every presentation that we do. We try to teach people about the science that comes behind it because the scientific research is really what's going to be driving conservation efforts in the future. Birds are my macro indicators of um, habitat uh, status and habitat health. So with that in mind, the research that we're going to do is going to be uh, able for us to kind of guide different conservation effort depending on what we notice about our bird population. So we're really um, lucky to be in the position where we're collecting a lot of data uh, in a short amount of time and over many years, and therefore we'll be able to do more and more of this kind of research. Another one of our core principles, I guess, is to be stewards of birds in the uh, important bird area of Prince Edward County. Um, so everybody, I'm assuming at Peck Fen is very fam familiar with that. Um, it encompasses the entire South Shore and the waters kind of up from there. Um, and now that it's being turned into a KBA, this is also going to be part of our mandate. But Pepo is really trying to kind of take a big step and be a reputable source of information on bird populations, bird health in and around southeastern Ontario with a major focus in Prince Edward County. So that's something that like we're really passionate about and that we're really looking forward to. 
Um, so where we're located, I wasn't sure where everybody would be from, so I decided I would do it in three stages. Um, so as you can see on the first map, map number one, we are uh, between Toronto here and Ottawa with Montreal just off to the side here, so right near Kingston. And then once you zoom into Prince Edward County, which is this huge area here with some of the places cut off, um, you can see that we're located right at the most furthest southeastern point of the county. And if we look here, we are located in this big green block here, which is the um, National Wildlife Area, which is a property that is owned and um, managed by Canadian Wildlife Services. We have a partnership with Canadian Wildlife Services, and we have with, had one with them for the last 27 years for us to be able to conduct this research um, on the property. Um, so just a little view of the terrain. As you can see, there's a lot of like these paler green areas here. And the paler green areas is what used to be farmland habitat that they were using for grazing. The soil is not made for farming because it's poor quality, but it is very good for growing grasses and grasslands, which um, cattle would graze on and therefore that was the farming practice used there. You can see where the observatory is located that there is a small patch of forest here. And this small patch of forest is where the banding station is located. Part of our area of research is surrounding this entire area. And we try to get as big of a view of the area as we can with um, occasional trips up here to this portion. Um, of the observatory because we are trying to see what Traverse Woods looks like as well as our area here and then also the harbor. So all of this habitat here is something that we're really looking at when we're looking at different bird migration populations moving through the area. So what it kind of looks like on the ground, you can see here, um, this photo on the right here is a, kind of a mixed uh, red cedar savanna habitat. So there's some deciduous trees mixed with some red cedar trees. You can see that they're kind of above our head height now and they've grown to um, levels that are not um, open field habitats as they were in the past. But you can see in this net lane area where we do our bobolink research program that it's very open and very clear. We're maintaining this habitat currently for our research on bobolink and that's what we're um, using for our open habitat that they would prefer to land in. Um, and then here you can see that we're adjacent to the water and having this kind of water adjacent property is something that you'll notice is really important when looking at bird migration. Birds tend to follow water sources or major bodies of water when uh, moving, usually due to the necessity of accessibility and uh, of fresh water. And so that's something that's really important here. And then uh, we have a, our area, our netting area that used to be kind of a smaller forest or hardwood forest has now grown into something a lot more mature. And so kind of blocked off here, you have the height of a typical person and double that, that's another uh, five and a half feet and so on. So you can tell that it's really high up and therefore the habitats changed and grown a lot over the time. We have a lot of Eastern white cedar habitat here as well. Um, that's kind of mixed in our net lane area. So the mixture of red cedars, deciduous habitat and um, thick understory, as you can see, is kind of a good mixture of habitat for different species migrating through because different birds have different niches that they like to occupy for um, their fueling resources or their breeding habitat. So let's talk a little bit more about bird migration flyways. Those are the major routes that you will notice large numbers of birds using in migration. Um, something that you may not know is that we can track bird movements through regular wet weather radar, which means that we can see masses of birds moving across land um, by the way that the weather radar is picking them up. They'll think that it's, if you look at it, you'll think it's a rain cloud, but a rain cloud suddenly appearing at exactly 7.30 p.m. when the sun sets is actually thousands, if not millions of birds uh, taking off and making their way either north or south, depending on the migration season. 
our location is here where this little red dot is. You can see that it's a good intersection here between the Atlantic and the Mississippi Flyway, which means that birds heading to the boreal forest in this big orange circle here are coming up in this direction and will be heading either northeast towards um, uh, northern Quebec or northwest towards Alberta. So some of the birds that we encounter in Ontario could make all their could make their way all the way up into um, Alberta should that bird require this kind of range. So they kind of funnel their way through the east part of the continent and then kind of funnel their way out into the boreal forest in this huge area here. And so the majority of the birds that we do have moving in large numbers coming through our area are boreal breeding birds like this magnolia warbler, but you can occasionally find these guys breeding in our area as well, but a higher concentration of them will definitely be seen the further north you go uh, with these guys. So why is that area so important? Like I mentioned, we're an intersection of these two major flyways. And because of that, we're getting a genetic diversity of different species. Because we have so many different species, which is about 95 to 100 species a year moving through our area that we're able to do population trends on, we're able to see kind of how these um, species populations are changing. And at the same time, if we are to do uh, genetic research on these birds, we'll encounter populations from vastly different areas. So the birds that will go northeast versus the bird that will go northwest are maybe the same species, like in oven birds that will breed all across the boreal forest. Um, we're very likely to be catching both um, genetic diverse species. So like the same way that, you know, we would know somebody from, you know, the northeastern part of the US um, might is still a human being, but um, they're going to be genetically different than somebody um, from China. But you know, we're all humans, we're all the same species, same thing with these birds, they're going to have genetic diversity. And therefore, that intersection of the two flyways is a good mix of kind of these two groups of birds. We're also located in an area that's directly after or before an important part of the journey that these birds are taking in migration. So I'll explain a little bit about that later, but it's essentially because we're so close to this, we are at the edge of this large body of water, which is Lake Ontario, birds are going to be, um, need to be in constant flight with no stopping to make it all the way over um, that lake. And so that means that the birds need our habitat either to land after such a migration or to fuel up before doing this migration. Um, we're a really important stopover habitat, which means that we have a high food availability for these birds. I'm sure everybody who's been, uh, who's been around the county or around um, the lake has noticed midges um, infesting kind of our areas over the years. Um, every season there's a timing of these midges erupting and that's the exact same thing that birds are depending on when I know I, I had to reset everything but it's fine. Oh. Um, so essentially um, these birds are kind of using this um, food source that we have here as a Con like a conservation area to build up all these fat resources that are necessary for them when they're going to be doing their next leg of migration. Because most of the birds, their final stop is not where we are, but it's actually either north or south, depending on whether it's spring or fall. So it's really important. It's a really important area that requires us to conserve this area for them to be able to do that. And depending on weather condi conditions, Prince Edward Point might be the last landmass that a bird might see on their way south during the fall, or it might be the first landmass that they see on their way north in the winter, uh, in the spring, sorry. And so just a little bit of a view of that, this is Lake Ontario. Um, and we are located where this big red dot is here. And um, this journey here is about 56 um, kilometers which is an incredible thing for anybody to let alone walk. Uh, but birds need to do this journey in one night. If not, if not, then they end up in the lake. So a lot of times we um, assume that some birds 
may take off directly from the Oswego County area and do the jump directly to Petbo, therefore meaning that this is the first landmass they see, or they'll take their way along Lake Ontario to make it to these smaller islands. And once again, the closest point after Main Duck Island here will be again Petbo. So that means that we get a huge concentration of birds arriving at Petbo during a high migration night. A high migration night would be composed of um, would be composed of nights where the winds are uh, optimal for migration. So in the spring, they need winds pushing them from the south north. So those winds are called south winds. And these south winds can either be from the southeast or the southwest. And the southeast winds would essentially be pushing birds from this area all the way into Pepo. And the southwest winds would be pushing birds from uh, further down kind of on the other side of the lake, but therefore less likely to end up in our area. So southeast winds would be the ones more likely to bring birds in our area. Something that we've noticed over time at Pepo is that um, birds will often land at Pepo in higher numbers when the winds are of lower intensity. So wind gusts uh, or wind strengths, I guess, of five miles an hour or less are not very strong at pushing birds north towards us. Um, but And therefore, that means birds have to do a lot more work when flying across the lake. This means that we are very likely to get a busier or or more intense migration um, evidence at the point when we have those kinds of wind conditions. So it's really interesting for us to like be able to predict that, which we have noticed in the past, um, especially on the day in the spring when we had, in the fall, uh, not in the fall, in the spring when we had 380 birds and the night before we had southeast winds that were un, almost unrecognizable at ground level, therefore almost no winds, but at higher altitudes, it was just low southeast winds that just pushed a bunch of birds into our area and the day prior, we had banded um, maybe 80 birds. And that next day, we banded 380 birds. So obviously, all these birds didn't just evade our nets the day before. It was a new movement and arrival of birds. So it's really interesting for us to kind of see this movement happen. And it just reinforces that like we're a really important landmass that if birds are struggling to get across the lake, we'll be really happy to find because we're high in resources, uh, because we're a conserved national wildlife area, and we're able to provide this healthy stopover location for them to continue their journey in the future. Something that we have noticed is that if the conditions are right, i.e. with the winds from the southeast doing well, but very strong winds, we often don't get the number of birds that we would expect on a regular migration night. These birds usually typically fly right over us and end up in um, further in the county or further north. And therefore, it's just really interesting to see how weather can affect a bird's migration. So that's kind of the gist of why our location is very important, um, because it's kind of an island in in some sense because the width here of the peninsula is only all about a kilometer and a half or maybe two kilometers at its best so birds are really really looking for like their first landmass that they can reach so that's about an overview of why we are so important as um, a location for migration because you know anybody could argue like well why here why not anywhere else along the south shore and obviously there's a lot of other land masses here at the south shore and we have evidence that um, there's good migration in some of those areas like charwell point for example that i'm sure a lot of people have heard of and then um i is it rocky no what's the point peter on the other side of the island um or on the other side of the county, but on the South Shore, um, is also another point that we would assume for. But we're we're really an island that birds have to stop at. There's no, I could go a little further. There's no, I could stop a little before. It's really like we need to stop here as opposed to kind of more, as you get closer, deeper into the county where birds kind of can even out or spread out a little more and therefore are less 
apparent in terms of their migration numbers. So um, it's a, another reason why we're important. So let's talk a little bit about the rare and endangered birds that we do encounter at the station. What would categorize birds as rare and endangered is that oftentimes for us, personally, when we capture or see these birds, they kind of goes hand in hand because a rare bird is often also an endangered bird because we don't usually see these birds. Um, their populations are either low because of their endangered status, or we don't see many of them because we're not in their typical uh, migration or breeding range. Um, a rare bird is really just a bird that we don't see often in the area, but could occur in our area. And an endangered bird is a bird that is listed in the Canada Species at Risk Registry. And so those are based on different characteristics of um, the bird's populations. For and before I go into the birds that we catch that are rare or endangered, some visual observations of birds that are considered endangered are uh, eastern whippoorwills. So I'm sure anybody who spent a night or two in the county can attest. We hear whippoorwills regularly in migration and over the summers. And so in the National Wildlife Area, we do have a steady population of them every year where at least three or four can be heard just from the station, uh, different singing individuals, therefore indicating potentially um, um, uh, three pairs, therefore meaning six birds. Um, and that's just from the station. So that's a really good kind of observation. And we do um, try to participate in Eastern Whippoorwill programs. Uh, like monitoring programs during the summers to actually estimate population numbers since they're a harder species to um, do banding monitoring with because they are migrate night migrants. Um, and then barn swallows, uh, that's going to come in kind of a little bit later when we talk about aerial insectivores in general, but we do see a good number of barn swallows in our area using the old uh, fishing village buildings that are around and therefore we do have a breeding population of barn swallows at the point. So that's part of those visual observations of these birds. So let's talk a little bit about Canada warbler. Um, they're a boreal breeder but have seen an 80% decline in their population in the last um, 20 to 30 years and a really uh, an indication of why that is could be habitat loss. These birds are really dense habitat, old growth with high density understory habitat breeding birds. And a lot of our forestry practices are of, you know, cutting large old growth forests and then replacing them with, you know, again, we're replacing the same amount of trees, but what was missing is the shrub habitat that these birds require to breed in. So um, Petbo has seen fluctuating numbers of these. We haven't seen a purposeful decline. So we have seen some years with high numbers and some years with low numbers. Um, in the last four years, we've seen numbers at a pretty steady number in terms of our capture rates, which could indicate that the population is kind of steady throughout the two flyways that we're monitoring. Um, but in some in some other places, it could be the case where you don't see out many, if any, um, Canada warblers. So it's really important to keep an eye on this species because um, if we don't keep an eye on them, then how are we going to be able to influence policy that would affect kind of uh, the conservation of this species? Bobolink is, we have a Bobolink banding program. So they've seen a huge population decline um, as well, and this is due to our agricultural practices. Um, Bobolink, we're, we're um, specialty birds that breed in um, long grass fields and habitats, and all of those kind of habitats have either been um, grown into forests, which is what we've seen in the West, where like a lot of the openness, open field habitats have kind of become overgrown with trees and therefore no longer bobolink breeding habitat, or they've been turned into farm fields. And because of those um, um, farm fields, um, the farmers typically of hay and grasses will be cutting multiple times a year and oftentimes cut their grass before any breeding birds like bobolink have a time to have um, fledglings, which means young birds don't have a time to make it out of the nest and therefore um, only adult birds are surviving because they're the only ones that can fly away. So there's been a lot of um, 
uh, impact on their populations. And uh, a lot of the governments in their respective provinces have given incentive to farmers to not cut their lawn before a certain date. We recommend July 15th because that's kind of the best um, period. That's kind of where we're guaranteed that the fledglings that have made it will make it and therefore will have a, a proper reproduction year. So something that PEPBO does when monitoring Bobolink is we're really making sure that there's a consistency in the difference between older birds and younger birds. If we're noticing that older birds are the only ones that are surviving, then we're noticing that there's a problem with the young bird survivorship, which means that we're that there's a problem with uh, where they're reproducing, i.e. their farm fields and so on. So um, PEPO is also a really unique location because we are the only station that regularly monitors bobolink populations in migration. And we've been doing this since 2008. So this will be our 15th year of doing this program. And so last year we had a really productive year and caught a lot of bobolink. And this year we had a lower year. So 2022, we had a lower year of bobolink captures, but this can be due to a lot of effects, either um, environmental fragmentation um, or weather um, patterns being a little differently, uh, different. And so our conditions are very varied in this sense. And so it's important for us to keep doing this year by year because one year's data will not be able to tell us that the population is suddenly declining. So uh, this is a really interesting bird. It's the first ever Acadian flycatcher that PEPO has banded in since 1995. This population is uh, listed as, a as an endangered species by the Species at Risk Registry. And this could be due to the fact that these birds are not really associated with um, our kind of habitat. They're known to breed um, further south from us in more Carolinian forests, which we're going to address in our rare bird section. And so it's really interesting for us to get this first bird. Um, to anybody who has tried birding flycatchers, they are really very difficult birds to identify um, or differentiate between others. Um, you might be able to see here in this image, there's a little bit of a yellow dot in the top corner of this bird's wing. Um, this is part of a quote unquote third wing bar. So they have more barring on their wings than the other flycatchers that we would confuse them with. And so this, and then we have measurements that we're able to take when we have these birds in hand. So it's possible that these birds have been missed in the past and that this is just the first that we've been able to finally identify and record. But it's a really important bird because if it is the first Acadian flycatcher, um, in the area, it could indicate that their populations are moving north. So if we see them regularly from year to year, then maybe that's an indication that this is happening. Um, something that's really important to note here is that Acadian flycatchers may be listed as species at risk, uh, and but they're not the only flycatcher. Um, Olive-sided flycatchers and um, yellow-bellied flycatchers and least flycatchers are all birds that are as in their name entails, flycatchers, meaning they're aerial insectivores. Because of our, because of not just our, but also the our neighbors to the south's um, uh, investment in pesticide use, um, it kind of limits what is available for these birds to um, feed on during migration. So, like we were saying, that Pepo is a really important stopover location. Flycatchers must really appreciate our location because we have an undisturbed habitat, no pesticide, and a lot of um, insects. Some birds that will end up stopping over in areas where they're surrounded by farmland won't be as lucky and therefore might not be able to build the fat resources that'll allow them to migrate north. This is something that we'll see in most, if not all aerial insectivores. So that includes swallows, um, like we were mentioning before with the barn swallows. So tree swallows, barn swallows, purple martins, and then all the flycatchers like that. So really important to keep an eye on this species as well, because um, flycatchers will be an indication of what we're doing to those, uh, our aerial insectivore population. And so we're really fortunate to have caught this bird last year. Um, a red-headed woodpecker. So this one might not have as red of a head as you might expect, but that's because it's a juvenile. And so this bird is not often caught at 
hepo. But it is a population that is considered um, at risk. Um, and but their populations have been slowly increasing. Uh, at PEPA, we've noticed a significant increase in the number of visual observations of these birds. So um, with despite us not catching as many of them, woodpeckers in general who are migratory are typically not in huge numbers. So redheaded woodpeckers and yellow-bellied sapsuckers are not like a large portion of the birds that we'll be capturing. So it's really good for us to like see young birds making it and capturing these birds. So um, the red-headed woodpeckers uh, reasoning for their decline is also habitat loss. Again, they like old growth forests, like really large trees with little understory. So kind of the opposite of a Canada warbler that requires a lot of dense understory, these guys require no understory. So it's possible that regrowth of fragmented forests in the past with any replanting that we've done has contributed to um, re-increasing their populations. So that's all stuff that needs to be researched, of course, to see why we're seeing an increased number of these birds in our area. It's possible that the growth of our forest at the point um, has like, contributed to that because, because our land is not um, very fruitful to produce um, uh, crops and so on, that means that our understory is also not very fast growing. So is there a population of these birds breeding in our area? That's unknown and unlikely at this point, but you know, more and more of these observations will be really important for us and maybe we'll be able to actually see that they are reproducing in our area. So we'll keep an eye on that as well. So uh, the last endangered bird that I'm going to talk about is the golden wing warbler. So we, um, there's a lot of things that have affected the golden wing warbler, like habitat loss, like in most birds that are endangered. Um, and these guys require dense shrubby habitat and um, their range uh, usually stops kind of in the lower, you know, the southeastern portions of Ontario. And because of development around the Great Lakes and so on, their habitats have been lost. And they like, um, and also the, another really big issue is their hybridizing. So they are birds that are very, very close genetically to blue winged warblers. And because of that, these birds have been known to hybridize very regularly. And because these birds are hybridizing regularly, then um, the genetic, I guess, purity of these birds is being lost. And it's kind of, and their offspring are also able to reproduce. And their offspring are called Brewster's warbler. But when they are reproducing again, they very rarely will mate with golden wing warblers. So blue wing warblers are doing fine in population numbers because a lot of the hybrids that the golden wing warblers are creating are kind of reverting back into blue wing warblers over time. So it's really important for us to see is the golden wing lineage going to kind of merge with blue wing warbler and just become blue wing warblers or are they going to be able to sustain that? That's kind of why we have efforts in preserving specifically golden wing warbler habitat where they don't interbreed with blue wing warblers so that we can kind of maintain the species. Um, we do get, uh, every year we'll get anywhere from um, one to six golden wing warblers of the pure variety in our area, uh, in our nets. And so it's really cool for us to see that there are still a number of these guys around year to year. Um, this spring, we had a really busy year for blue wing, golden wing, and Brewster's warbler, where we caught five golden wing warblers, um, 12 blue wing warblers, and two Brewster's warbler. So we're kind of seeing these three populations of birds all migrating through our area and at some point um, diversifying and choosing different habitat. So we'll see how this population um, continues over the years. So let's talk about rare birds. And because we're gonna talk about rare birds, we need to talk about Carolinian forest species. Um, so this is kind of in this central hardwood range. So if you look at this range of habitat here, that's also associated with um, the Carolinian species that we talk about. So we, our black-capped chickadees have cousins to the south called Carolina chickadees um, that 
only breed in the southern parts of Pennsylvania and further south, and they don't interbreed often, if at all, with uh, black capped chickadees. So um, on top of that, uh, this habitat type uh, might not be encroaching, but the weather conditions here has been changed, has been observed in our area because of climate change. So we've seen um, increase in temperatures and, you know, longer springs, um, shorter winters, milder winters, and so on. So we're seeing a lot more birds that are often seen, often considered breeders in these areas, migrating up north into our territory or into southern Canada. So we're located here, but the Carolinian species usually end on the south shore there, if not even further south into uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland area. So um, it's really interesting to kind of see these birds regularly appear in uh, at Pet Bone. So one of these species is the yellow-breasted chat. So yellow-breasted chat are not super uncommon in southern Ontario if we go southwest from here, so past Toronto and um, into kind of the more London area. Uh, but again, that is further south from us. But we're noticing that we're getting observations of these guys or multiple observations of these guys every year. This year, we caught a yellow-breasted chat very early on in the year, which is which makes sense because these are early migrant birds further south. Having worked at uh, Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory in Maryland, where these guys were regular captured, they are one of the first migrants to kind of make their way back into uh, Maryland. So that's one of the species. And then Carolina wren is one of the biggest species that we've seen a huge increase. Um, they're overwintering birds in the Carolinian forest, but it does snow there and it does get cold, but it is a lot milder. So in the last, I would say, four years, because I started visiting Pet Bow in 2018, um, and we saw Carolina Wren in 2018, but the bander in charge at the time was telling me that it was super rare, super uncommon, never seen, and so on. But every single year since, at least one or two of these birds has been seen year round. And then during migration, we are also, we're now capturing them regularly, both in the spring and in the fall. And we are seeing them on breeding grounds. So we've captured a breeding female during our MAPS program. And we captured a freshly hatched juvenile at the Sandbanks Provincial Park. So from our MAPS station all the way southeast, um, where we caught a breeding female, we also caught a brand new juvenile all the way in the west. So it's really interesting that there's at least two populations of Carolina wren breeding in the county alone. So that's another Carolinian species that we're seeing a lot of. And again, Carolina wren associated with the Carolinian forest area. So this year, we also caught a wide-eyed vireo. So these are frequent breeders in the Carolinian forest. And this year, we caught another wide-eyed vireo. Um, these are harder to detect as well. Like they are, they look like most vireos. And so being able to see these birds is already a challenge for most birders and then for us to have captured one is even more incredible so um these guys have been occasionally caught at petbo in the past but this is kind of the first one we've caught in the last six years but again this year we've caught a lot like all these birds were captured this year and so are we did we have a really good migration of these birds or are birds just now starting to push their way further north. Um, hooded warblers have also become a common occurrence for us. So every year we'll catch at least one or two hooded warblers now, but in the past hooded warblers were maybe once every three years they would see one because it overshot its migration. So hooded warblers we caught I think five in the fall this year and so and this is an adult male and so we're really interested to see if hooded warblers are going to become consistent migrants through our area um, so again another bird that's usually more associated with breeding breeding in the southern parts of the continent and then yellow-billed cuckoos so we're so black-billed cuckoos are considered frequent breeders in this area and further north from here, they can make their way all the way into boreal forests sometimes. And yellow-billed cuckoos are not as often seen up here, but are frequent breeders of southern forests where it's more temperate 
um, or we're where it's more humid and warm for longer periods. And so we're also noticing a huge increase of these guys with observations of these guys happening regularly, both at the point, but also um, all around the county. Um, so that's another species that's super um, important for us to see. Finally, in the last two years, we've seen um, yellow-throated warblers like consistently um, appearing in our area. They're, they are considered the first warblers to arrive in the southern forested areas of the United States. So kind of in the um, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, and so on area. And they're kind of like they're myrtle warblers. Like our yellow rump warblers are the first that we see in the winter, but um, this was act in the spring, I mean, but this exact individual here was the first warbler that we saw that year, and we saw it on April 14th. Um, so again, a bird that's moved all the way up here, and then we had an observation of them last year as well. So if this pattern continues and we see another observation of this guy this year, then maybe we're going to be starting to see a pattern of this bird starting to maybe establish territories or breeding in our area. So we're really kind of keeping an eye on the rare birds that are moving through the point. It's super interesting for us to see that. And, you know, the same way that like maybe these birds are all appearing at Pepo out of a fluke, it would be really interesting for that to always be a coincidence, you know? So that's why it's super important for us to continue to kind of monitor this because if these habitat, if these birds are moving further north in terms of territory, then like we're kind of getting an obvious explanation that climate change is occurring, especially for some breeding bird species. So I'm curious to see if something like a blue gross beak will end up in our nets at some point, um, which is another bird that's associated down there, or if the numbers of these birds also increases over time. So it's really important for us to continue doing what we're doing and um, our location is primed for all birds that need to stop at any point in time and so we're really looking into continuing to do that over the years and um, that's why PEPO is like super important to monitor all these birds. So if anybody has any questions um, please uh, feel free to ask. I know I just kept rambling on and on and on. I'm sure there might be a few questions. So um, yeah, that's it. Or not. Um, okay. Jerry, sorry about that. <laughs> there are some, you know, I, I think that, um, Jerry, are you, would you like to handle the question period? Still, I think she's probably on mute. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, mute. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, that I'm was sorry. a wonderful yeah. quote, by the way. I'll, I'll mute myself now, though. Okay. So this question is from Lester Stanfield. You highlighted that Pepbo is at the nexus of the eastern and central flyways. Has there been research to demonstrate the correlation between Pepbo catches and both the other flyways? Or is it more that Pepbo is a hybrid location, that it is catching birds from both flyways? It is important because variance in catches could reflect differences between the contribution from either the eastern or the central flyways, not population stated. Yeah, so um, there hasn't been like a specific research on um, like the differences between cent uh, central or eastern flyways yet. Um, we actually just this year in 2022 are participating in a isotope program for boreal breeding birds. So that's with Environment Climate Change Canada, where we submitted a bunch of feather samples from a variety of different species. I think we were doing 30 different species. I mean, Susan was there watching us pluck feathers from these birds, but we were collecting multiple species and multiple feathers um, 
of each species. I think we were doing like 20 of each species so that we can get a representative sample of where these birds are coming from. And I think it's going to be really important for us to do that because, um, as I mentioned, like uh, a rare bird that we do get is the yellow-breasted chat. And their subspecies found in Western Ontario, which we wouldn't get here because we're not in the Okanagan Valley or anywhere near that, um, is endangered, but it's a subspecies of yellow-breasted chat. So over time, like if we're noticing that maybe one species is, or one genetic, I guess, version, one flyway is doing better than the other, then we'll be able to kind of do a better estimate. Like we're really, we're really at the intersection. There's a lot of theory that we're more of the Atlantic flyway area than the, because of how like directly below James Bay we are, which, you know, the two splits. Um, so there's some kind of theory of that, but like nothing has been actually done specifically on research. This year, actually, Pepo just hired um, a new assistant bander named um, Ashley Jensen, who has a really big keen interest in doing research. So that's definitely an avenue that we're looking into. And Pepo is also looking to kind of start associating themselves with um, more universities or with any university to do more research. So we have a Bobolink research with Trent that we're doing now, but we are also trying to, we are going to be trying to reach out to professors at, you know, Queen's University, which is local for us. And then um, even like any universities in Toronto and so on to participate in this kind of research because we have all of this data. If we're not doing it ourselves or we can't afford to do it ourselves, because as most people who know nonprofits, it's all about funding, um, you know, like we try to associate with people who can do it. So we're really looking forward to stepping more into the research role and to be able to be like, okay, this is exactly what Pepo is or was. And so we can do those kinds of things. Do you do any DNA sampling from the feathers that you collect? Yeah, so um, I don't think I don't think it's DNA. It's more isotopes. So we're really looking at like where they're breeding, so where these birds are coming from based on their environment. Um, but you know, if we did, we would have probably have to like do clippings or like um, draw blood and so on. And so that's part of another a different kind of research um, that we would have to do. And or I'd be I'd be really interested in kind of learning to bar about that stuff. So. Okay, thanks. Um, Mona, you've got your hand up. Question. Yes. Oh, Philip, I, I was so pleased to hear all that update. Uh, wonderful information. Thank you. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say <clears throat> your presentation um, reinforced how important it is for us to preserve our South Shore, how important it is. Oh, yeah. These birds. Well, that's why, like, you know, like, Pepo is closely affiliated, right, with PECVAN and with the South Shore Joint Initiative, because, you know, our goal really is to, you know, promote the conservation of the South Shore and promote yeah. natural habitat, like, yeah. you know, the county itself is a huge landmass that is pointing out of, you know, main quote unquote mainland into Lake Ontario. Like it could, it is a major hub for all birds, you know, like just because we're a good location to catch a good number of birds, a representative sample of birds, doesn't mean that there aren't millions of birds landing all across the South shore, yeah. which we have to acknowledge as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. Oh, I didn't mention this, but we are also hoping that um, we're going to be partnering with Parks Canada to do research on Maine Duck Island itself. So um, whether in the uh, form of a MAPS program or migration monitoring program, we're really looking into that opportunity to see like, you know, because if we're, if we can do something at the, in Maine Duck Island, that shows that we're getting birds from Maine Duck Island to Pepo, that would be like revolutionary. Like we would have like a proof of island hopping requirements during migration under X condition, you know, like it would be like really cool for us to do that. Obviously Maine Duck is a really hard area to stay in or work in, but <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. 
So a comment from Laurie Borthwick. Wow, that was really interesting, Philip. Thank you. And from Susan Warwick. I want to see a hooded warbler this spring. Such a beautiful bird. So see if you can arrange that, please. <laughs> I'll make sure to call you or put you on the day that uh, <laughs> yeah. was volunteering on that day. And uh, I'm from Elizabeth H. U. Uh, just rejoined, actually, um, I'm partly um, nudged by the, by knowing that this presentation was going on. So thank you for that, Philip. Uh, Elizabeth had to leave. Um, any more questions? So I, I have one. Are you seeing a change in insect populations because of climate change? I'm thinking about those little gnats that, that buzz around and that the birds well, love and you know, we don't. Um, I personally haven't, but mm -hmm. I also like live with them. So I, it's just a nonstop. And like even um, Mark um, Pattison, our, our facilities manager, he lives on the north shore of the point and he gets hoarded every year with midges like nonstop. Like he almost can't like open his door without like thousands kind of going into his home. So um, he is, yeah, he, he would be saying, no, there is no <laughs> change or no noticeable change anyways uh, <laughs> at the current state. But yeah, no, there's tons and tons of midges around. I think the issue might be that like pop insects that aren't midges might be decreasing and, you know, we aren't noticing that. But um, I would say that in the national wildlife area, we don't really have that issue. There's uh, not much habitat being affected there in, in our sense. So, you know, we always, I think we look for monarchs and monarch caterpillars and stuff like that. So um, I think it's kind of hit or miss in terms of monarchs in the county. We had a really dry beginning of um, the summer, I guess. And so I, it didn't really, we didn't get a lot of monarchs breeding in our area, but we did get a good migration of them further later in the fall. Amy, you put your hand up. Muted. Um, yeah, yeah, just unmuted. Um, you were going to talk a little bit about aerial foragers, which you didn't get into. Yeah, so aerial foragers are the tree swallows, um, fly catchers. I guess that's pretty much it, really. But like, um, so they're birds that will literally sit on a branch, fly out, catch an insect, a flying insect, and then fly back to the branch, or just stay in flight consistently feeding on birds in the air. And so because those are the birds that are usually sprayed for or insects that are usually sprayed for um, because of their ability to go from crop to crop then they're the population of insects that are like suffering and therefore because like aerial insectivores have very niche diet therefore they're not able to be as broad with what they're eating like we have yellow rump warblers that can either eat berries or caterpillars or insects you know, like I've fed mosquitoes to yellow rump warblers. I've seen them eat caterpillars. I've seen them eat, you know, the uh, red cedar berries. So like those kind of birds are more opportunistic and can change their diet to be fine. But um, aerial insectivores don't have that luxury. If there are no aerial insects, there are no aerial insectivores, which is why we're really noticing kind of that thing, that happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. So um, Phil, I would like to thank you on behalf of everybody. What a marvelous presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so much um, and love your enthusiasm as well mm -hmm. as your breadth of knowledge. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier about education programs and mm -hmm. uh, I think this video needs a really broad distribution because mm -hmm. it would help people understand how important the South Shore is, as, as Myrna said. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see um, a change in populations because of, um, because of climate change and the Carolinian species. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, it, w it was absolutely a wonderful presentation and I can't wait to watch it again on the SSJI YouTube channel. So 
Yeah, and if anybody wants to learn more about the station and other things, like I could go um, just come down to the station this spring. We open April 10th and we go until the end of May. Our spring birding festival is, I don't know if it's announced yet, but I can tell you guys. Um, <laughs> it is the four day weekend. So it's the 12th to the 15th of May. So keep that in your calendars if you want to come. And we're hoping to pack it jam packed so you, we can do a lot of things in one day so you can spend the whole day at the point kind of thing. Um, as opposed to like spread out over 10 days like we used to do. We're trying to really like yeah. do a big, big boom of stuff. Well, marvelous. So um, Phil, we always give our speakers um, a little speaker's gift, something um, yeah. impactful and people. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll deliver it to you in April when yep. you're back. Oh, that's nice. Thank you guys. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah, I was like, I guess Susan will. Uh, I'll like deliver it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Phil. And also, if anybody wants to like email me any questions, like I'll put my email in the chat and you guys can email me questions. If you have any questions about birds or Pepo, I'm always down to um, answer questions. So, so one more comment from Louise War, who um, is a guest tonight. She's not a member. I had a lot of guests ask for the, the Zoom link, which is great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this presentation. And we all did. So. Yes. I hope I didn't talk too long. I don't no. know. What <laughs> Not at all. It was great. Thank you so much. No problem. So, Amy? Okay. So, I'll end up the meeting. Philip, that was terrific. It just reminds us how lucky we are to have Pepo in the county. So, I yeah. urge everyone to go to donate to Pepo. They are completely nonprofit, they don't have regular funding. So they need our support. Um, and we're so lucky to have you, Philip. And it's just, it's so yes. exciting to hear all that you all are doing and to hear about these changes, as Myrna said. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see climate change just so, uh, I'll worry and worry and worry about it. But it's also interesting to see the changes that are happening and how nature is responding to it because mm -hmm. it wants to survive. So that's kind of moving too. So I really appreciate it. So I'm just gonna end the meeting now. I wanna thank everyone for coming. And I want to remind everyone that our next meeting will be on, I've gotta find my notes, um, um, the, March. on March 28th. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, same time, same place via Zoom. So seven o'clock on March 28th. And it will be um, Jen, Jennifer Gagne will be speaking. She's a forest conservationist on our urban forest, a collaborative approach to sustainable management. And as we mentioned earlier, there will be a, an outing with Jen as well on March, on March 30th, a couple of days later, which will be at 10 o'clock in the morning at Macaulay Mountain, but we'll, we'll send out a notice about that for sure. So thank you. And, and actually we're hoping that that will be our last Zoom meeting for a while until next winter, if that, I mean, purely Zoom meeting. So we're hoping to meet in person again at the Bloomfield Town Hall, but of course we'll be letting you all know about that. So I wanna encourage new mem people who are just visiting for the first time to join PECFEN. Jerry, I did notice in the chat, you did put in the, uh, the um, website address so you can scroll through the chat if you guys, and, and find that if you want to. But thank you all for coming, have a great evening. Thanks again, Philip. You got me also very excited about spring. Yes. So we'll see you in April. And, and we so appreciate your doing this. It's just terrific. It and great to see everybody pleasure. here. Yeah, it was my right. pleasure. It was nice to talk to you. Everybody. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.